Will your name be found in the book of life? Will you be worthy to spend eternal life with Jesus on that glorious day? Today, only a few people on earth can answer this question with certainty. Most people simply go about their lives, assuming there's no need to address such a delicate matter. But this is something that'll determine where you spend eternity, either in heaven or in hell. Please, let me remind you that heaven and hell are real. Eternity is too vast for us to be uncertain about where we'll spend it. We need to know where we'll spend eternity. This is of utmost importance. It's become a popular notion that heaven and hell are religious fabrications designed to instill fear and maintain control. However, this is not true. If heaven and hell were merely concepts, Jesus would not have spoken of them. In the New Testament, Jesus addressed hell 70 times. If hell were a mere concept, Jesus would not have emphasized it in such a manner. Similarly, Jesus spoke about heaven two to three times more than he spoke about hell. Jesus spoke about the way to heaven in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. In this passage, Jesus conveys that the narrow gate's the only entrance to God's kingdom, and the Lord Jesus himself is both the gate and the way. Hence, the gate is exceedingly narrow, as Jesus is the only way and the only gate to it. God's narrow path leads us to spiritual and eternal life with Him. Yet in comparison to the multitude of people on earth today, only a few ever discover this narrow way. In this video, I'll reveal a startling truth about why many people are not going to reach heaven at the end of their journey here on earth. I'll also share some spiritual insights on how to avoid hell and the impending judgment of God. It's truly a blessing for you to be viewing this video at this moment. So open your heart and receive this message from God to you. But before we continue, did you know that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people? You might be pondering how that could be possible. Jesus informed his disciples in John 14 that he was going to prepare a place for them so that he could return and take them with him. Therefore, heaven is a meticulously prepared place exclusively for those who are prepared to live in it. Are you one of them, my friend? Before you answer, let's consider the real reason why many people are not going to heaven. The reason is simple. It's because of sin. What exactly is sin? The Bible teaches us that sin is disobedience against God. The first man and woman that God created disobeyed him. Satan led Adam and Eve to break God's law, marking the first instance of sin in human history. Genesis 3, 6-7 narrates, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This single act of disobedience altered the entire nature and behavior of humanity, significantly impacting the course of the world. Sin is disobedience to the Word of God. It's any act of rebellion against God. It involves acting according to one's own desires, contrary to God's Word and will. Having understood what sin is, it's crucial to discuss the operation of sin. Many people today are unaware that sin is primarily a nature before it manifests as an act. The nature of sin is inherent in every person. This is why no one ever taught you how to tell your first lie. By nature, you knew how to lie. As one naturally grows, the tendency to hate begins to develop. People may teach you to channel hatred towards things and others. However, that ability is not taught. Similarly, none of us was taught to seek revenge. Yet as we mature, we start to desire to avenge perceived wrongdoings by others. These behaviors affirm that sin is in nature. This is why David acknowledged that he was born and shaped in iniquity. 
Since this nature is within a person, sinning is not just a behavior, but a source of enjoyment. That's why many people derive pleasure from doing evil today, as the Bible confirms that sin is pleasurable. Do you know why many people are ensnared by sin? It's because they simply find pleasure in it. Enjoy the approval that comes with defying the Word of God and are content with the accolades they receive for associating with the influential in society. Hebrews 11.25 states, He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. This is why we must be cautious. The sin provides a temporary pleasure and satisfaction, but it's followed by silent guilt and potential doom. Sin does not only encompass fornication, drunkenness, idolatry, hatred, envy, and the like. These are the manifestations that confirm the presence of sinful nature, which is inherent in every person. Romans 3.23 declares, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, indicating that even without manifesting sinful acts, one is still a sinner, because the nature of sin resides within them. The remedy lies in believing in the finished work of Jesus on the cross to address this sinful nature. The world is crafted to entice you to love and indulge in sin. This occurs because Satan is the ruler of this world. He governs the world's systems. Numerous distractions abound, whether on the street, in the malls, or in the movies. He strategically positioned his agents to introduce the pleasure of sin wherever you go. 1 John 2, 15-17 admonishes, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This indicates that the system has been established by sinful people to operate without God. The society, objectives, thoughts, religions, and ways of living all stem from humanity's fallen nature. According to God's Word, the world does not know God. The world is unaware of what believers are. The world holds animosity towards Christ and believers, and it's under Satan's control. God has selected believers out of the world to be His own special people. The battle is thus between Satan and humans. He endeavors to subject everyone to God's judgment so that the same judgment he's under will apply to all people. At all costs, he portrays disobedience to God's law as alluring, aiming for individuals to fall for his schemes and to be condemned by God. However, it is your choice to succumb to his manipulation and deceit. As Satan can't control you, God's granted people free will. Now that we've established that sin is the reason, let's consider why sinners cannot enter heaven. Let me share two reasons. The first reason is, sinners bear the penalty of sin on them. Beloved, sin carries a consequence. The wages of sin is death. As the Apostle Paul beautifully captures in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. However, the good news is that Jesus paid the penalty of death so that we don't have to die. Yet anyone who refuses to believe has indicated their lack of interest in God's offer of life. Sin, indeed, pays its slaves' wages, and the wage is death. This death entails eternal separation from God. Every slave of sin receives precisely what they deserve and earn through their behavior. What behavior is that? Well, they reject God's offer of life. This is the most absurd choice any person could make. However, what God gives His slaves are not wages, but a gift, which is eternal life. This isn't what they deserve because they could never earn it. Yet in His mercy, God grants everlasting life with Him in heaven to all who receive His offer of life by believing in Jesus Christ. They don't serve Him to obtain eternal life. They serve Him because they already have eternal life. The second reason is, heaven is a place of holiness, righteousness, and order. Have you ever pondered what heaven would be like with just one sinner? Heaven would then not be holy, 
righteous, or orderly. Heaven would be tainted by just one sinner. Heaven is a realm of complete obedience to God, His Word, and His laws. However, admitting any sinner into heaven would simply allow unholiness, unrighteousness, and disorder into God's kingdom. It's not the actions people do or not do that make them righteous or holy. Rather, it's what they believe or don't believe. For instance, God views everyone who believes in Jesus as holy, righteous, and blameless. Conversely, God sees anyone who's not surrendered their heart to Jesus as unholy, unrighteous, and wicked. This is why the judgment of God is upon those who do not accept Jesus' sacrifice. Saints, people do not come under God's judgment for the outward displays of sin, but due to their refusal to let go of the sinful nature within them. Thus, it's exceedingly perilous to disregard the finished work of Christ and lead a life that does not align with God's will. Engaging in good deeds such as charity, helping the needy, and showing kindness and love will not earn one eternal life. Some individuals believe that performing these acts will make them at peace with God. However, the truth is that only accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior can bring peace with God, after which good works naturally follow. Merely attending church, undergoing baptism, or bearing a Christian name does not equate to being saved. Salvation comes from accepting Jesus as one's Savior and Lord. Someone might be a pastor, the child of a pastor, or a deacon, yet it does not guarantee salvation. Salvation is attained by acknowledging one's sinful nature, believing in Jesus' sacrifice, and confessing that He died for them. Romans 10.9 states, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe with your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. A stern warning is found in Matthew 7, 21-23, emphasizing that not everyone who claims to follow God will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will cite their prophesying, exercising demons, and performing miracles, yet Jesus will declare, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This scripture reminds us that good works alone cannot secure salvation. It's crucial to understand that the ability to preach sermons does not signify holiness, and the capacity to perform miracles is not indicative of salvation. Now, is it conceivable for those who are not genuine servants of God to prophesy, to convey God's message to people, and to perform miracles? Yes, it is possible. Consider Judas Iscariot, who was a thief influenced by a demon and wasn't a genuine follower of Jesus. Nevertheless, he received power and authority from Christ, along with the Seventy, when Jesus sent them out to go preach the gospel and cast out devils. Balaam also prophesied and proclaimed beautiful truths, yet he was an evil man. On the Day of Judgment, Jesus Christ will not disavow the words of those false prophets. However, he's fully aware that it's feasible to lack salvation, yet still be able to address him as Lord and perform miracles in his name. Jesus will not tell them, I once knew you, but I don't know you now. Instead, his words will be, I never knew you. In essence, these false prophets were never his sheep. They never belonged to him, and they were never God's children. I encourage you to make that decision today in answering this question. Do you have a relationship with Jesus that'll guarantee your entrance into heaven? Why would a God whose nature is to love choose not to save certain people? This poses a challenging reality about the love of God. While He is undeniably loving, He remains unyielding in upholding His standards. It is a common belief among Christians that God's will extends to all, irrespective of gender, age, or race, aiming for their salvation. The Scripture affirms this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. This scripture distinctly reflects God's disposition towards everyone on earth. God desires that all individuals grasp the truth about Christ and receive salvation, a reflection of His loving nature. Now, why do some people seem unable to receive this salvation? In today's video, I will be highlighting seven types of individuals who may face challenges in attaining salvation. 
in clearer words, seven people that cannot be saved. It's crucial to pay close attention, as many of us may not be aware that certain factors can hinder salvation for some people. I encourage you to watch this video in its entirety, participate in the prayers, and receive blessings for yourself, your family, and friends. Before we delve into the content, kindly show your support by liking this video, subscribing to our channel, and sharing this valuable content at least once. Your actions contribute to spreading the gospel, touching more lives, and advancing the kingdom of God on earth. Dear Saints, it is a sobering truth that not everyone in this world can or will be saved. This reality serves as a wake-up call, especially for those who faithfully attend church. Mere attendance for about 90 minutes on Sundays, committed membership, tithing, offering, having a Christian name or title, speaking in a Christian manner, or even undergoing baptism does not guarantee salvation. The Bible in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 22, records Jesus' warning about the judgment day. Many will approach him, boasting of miracles done in his name, but he will declare, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This truth urges every individual to introspect, questioning their standing on the judgment day when we must give an account of our lives. Consider whether if the Lord were to return today, you would be found worthy, dressed in His righteousness, standing blameless before His throne. Reflecting on this is crucial. I consider you to be blessed to be engaging in this video at such a significant time, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 reminds us. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body whether good or bad. Now, let us consider seven kinds of people that cannot be saved. The first group of people that God cannot save is unbelievers. But who exactly are unbelievers? They are the ones who do not believe in the birth, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the Bible, these people cannot be saved. There is only one way to attain salvation, and that is through faith in God. Without belief, one can never be saved from their sins and from Satan. There is truly no other way to attain salvation except through faith in God and belief in His Son, Jesus Christ. The famous scripture in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Perhaps some people underestimate the simplicity of God's redemptive plan. This is why unbelief is very dangerous. The only requirements for eternal life are simple. Believe, and then you will not perish. Secondly, God cannot save those who seek salvation through other means apart from Jesus Christ. In John 5, verse 40, the scriptures testify about Jesus, stating that some refused to come to Him for life. Jesus is the only way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through Him. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved other than Jesus Christ. Nothing else can save a person, not intelligence, power, money, good looks, or even parents or friends. We are saved only by the blood of Jesus, and His death on the cross has paid for our sins. Now, the next category of people that cannot be saved are the hypocrites. Jesus specifically addresses them in Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter who are trying to. A hypocrite is someone who pretends to be what they are not. On Sundays, they are dressed in righteous robes to go to church and lift up holy hands to God. But by the weekend, they are in the club like everybody else. To them, 
Salvation and the life of faith mean nothing exceptional. They see the church as a religious center. These people only worship God for public show, public approval, and acceptance. A hypocrite is in church, yet does not allow the life of Christ to find expression in them. They may spend many years in the church, but have no fruits to back up the faith they profess. They stand at the door, not going in, and yet would not allow others to go in. The fourth category of people that cannot be saved is the self-righteous. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, the Bible tells us the story of a Pharisee who trusted in himself, claiming to be righteous and despising others. The Pharisees believed that he was pure in heart and better than the publican. Interestingly, Jesus said that the tax collector, who could not lift up his eyes because of the guilt of his sin, but beat his breast and asked God for mercy, was the one who went down to his house justified and happy. The Bible has warned us not to trust in ourselves, but to trust in the Lord with all our hearts. Listen to what the Bible says about self-righteousness in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The Pharisees do not truly submit to God's righteousness. Rather, they carve out for themselves what righteousness is and the path to attain it. They have reversed God's standard of righteousness to suit themselves and their selfish ambitions. The fifth category is the apostate. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 to 22, the Bible clearly speaks to us about the apostate, saying, If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true, a dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. The Bible clearly paints a picture of those who, for one reason or another, become religious and leave behind their former corrupt and immoral practices, but soon their true nature shows up and they return to them. Moreover, a washed pig will still be a pig and nothing more. These are people who play along with the process and rudiments of Christian beliefs, such as baptism, communion, and church attendance. But after a while, their true self is revealed. They go back to the world with its lust and pleasure. They go back and find comfort in the things they once forsook because, in the first place, they never believed. The next category of people that the Bible clearly tells us cannot be saved is the blasphemers. Jesus spoke about these people in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 31 to 32. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Some people blaspheme against God simply by making a mockery of the Holy Spirit, making light of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. This is the unpardonable sin. You must be very careful about what you say about the Holy Spirit, because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Beware of jokes, associations, or groups of people that talk less about the move of the Spirit of God in any way. They may be luring you into committing the unpardonable sin. The last group of people that God cannot save is the dead. Many people go to pastors and religious leaders and solicit prayers during the burial of a loved one. Interestingly, no amount of prayer can be made for the dead. A man can only be saved while alive. After death, salvation is totally impossible. The idea of purgatory is false and not from the truth of the Word of God. Salvation is only possible when there is life. This is why it is important to give your life to Jesus. Dear friend, 
I hope you can see now that some people may not be saved. This isn't because God lacks love, but rather because He cannot compromise His standard of righteousness to save anyone. The greatest compromise occurred when God sent His Son to die for us on the cross of Calvary, even when we were still sinners. After this, if one chooses not to believe, God is not willing to compromise His standard for anyone again. In conclusion, have you truly accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, this is the right time to do so. Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for taking away my sin and making me whole through the death of your Son, Jesus. I believe that Jesus died and rose on the third day for my justification. Today, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and be my Lord. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Now, let's all pray together. Precious Father of life, we thank you for the salvation of our souls. Thank you for saving us from ourselves, sin, and death. We acknowledge that it is by grace that we are saved, and not by works or anything good that we have done or will ever do. We are truly grateful for your love, Jesus. Thank you for paying the debt for our sins, even when we were your enemies. We ask for your grace to live for you alone all the days of our lives. We pray for those who have not yet received Jesus as the Lord of their lives, that you will reach out to them and find them in Jesus' name. We pray for those in dire need of salvation right now, that the Holy Spirit will minister to their hearts and they will see the need to accept Jesus. We also pray for missionaries and everyone involved in the world of soul winning and evangelism. Bless them and give them the courage and grace to keep spreading the message of the gospel globally in Jesus' name. We pray for our loved ones and families who have yet to allow the Lordship in their homes. May your love be shed in their hearts by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Thank you, for we know when we call, you always answer. We ask all these things through Christ our Lord. The rapture is one of the most talked about occurrences among Christians and even non-Christians. It's not just a predicted future event. It's a prophetic future event that will undoubtedly happen. When? We don't know. However, here's what we do know. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-17 tells us, According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. When the rapture happens, believers will be taken to meet with the Lord in the clouds. It's a glorious experience that every believer earnestly awaits. The rapture is an event for the Lord's people who have placed their faith in the saving grace of Jesus and have turned away from a life of sin. This means that no matter how many good people are on the earth or how much good you do, if you're not a believer living for God, you won't be taken up when the rapture occurs. Some people believe that the rapture will happen once and then happen again so that those who miss the first time will have the second. But the Bible doesn't say that. Hence, you must do all you can to ensure that you get this glorious experience. The rapture will only happen once. It will not have a repeat. Hence, being left behind is to be left to chaos and to the reign of the Antichrist. On the other hand, for those who will be raptured, it'll be the beginning of reigning with the Lord. This relationship between the raptured believers and Jesus will last forever and ever. They will not just escape the danger of hell, they'll also embrace and enjoy what it truly means to have eternal life. Why? Because the last enemy, which is death, will be judged and vanquished. In this video, I'll explain what the rapture is. Please follow and pay careful attention, as this will grow your faith and remove any fear about the rapture from your heart. 
The word rapture describes an important event in the scripture where God takes up all believers in Christ Jesus from the earth to make way for his righteous judgment to be poured out during the tribulation period. It's also important to know and emphasize that the word rapture was not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. However, many verses point to the occurrence of this great event. Examples of these verses are found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Also, the epistles and other parts of the New Testament confirm the prophesied occurrence that we call the rapture. Because of the importance of this future event, a lot has been taught about the rapture. These teachings have left many people with many opinions about what the rapture is and what the rapture is not. One of the significant beliefs associated with the rapture is that many people erroneously believe that the rapture and the second coming are the same. However, the scripture didn't teach that the rapture and the second coming of Christ are the same event. Instead, the Bible clearly states that these two are separate events. Let me explain some differences between the rapture and the second coming. During the rapture, all believers will meet Jesus in the clouds, as written in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Whereas at the second coming, all raptured believers will return with the Lord to the earth to judge those remaining on the earth who didn't receive the beast's mark, to conquer the Antichrist and Satan, and to reign for a thousand years as found in Revelation 19 and 20. This is one significant difference between the two events. The rapture, as defined earlier, will be the removal of saints to meet with the Lord in the clouds. The second coming is when the Lord will return with all the believers who have been raptured to judge those left behind on the earth and imprison the devil for a thousand years. Secondly, the rapture will be instant, while the second coming of Christ will not be. 1 Corinthians 15.52 In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The rapture will happen very fast. However, the second coming will be announced and everyone alive will see Jesus return with the believers to reign on earth. Matthew 25, 27 For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Thirdly, the rapture can occur at any time. However, the second coming of Christ will not happen until some prophesied end-time events have occurred. This means that the rapture will precede the second coming. There are various interpretations and schools of thought surrounding the concept of the rapture. Nevertheless, the Bible remains the most valid and accurate source of information about this end-time event. The Bible is the only prophetic book that details this concept. Some faulty interpretations about the rapture today are 1. The rapture is for good and moral people. Nothing is further from the truth than this. The scripture teaches and confirms that the rapture is for believers in Christ Jesus. You may be a good, kind, generous, and law-abiding citizen of your country. Still, if you've not confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm afraid to tell you that you may be left behind at the rapture. 2. Believers who have died have no part in the rapture. The Bible doesn't teach this. The scripture teaches that the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, for instance, if you have a loved one who passed on and was a believer in Jesus Christ, then there's good news for you. They will rise first. They have hope, and we will all be with the Lord in the air in the rapture. So be encouraged, my friend. Now, one may ask, can anyone really prepare for the rapture? How do I prepare for this great event? The answer is absolutely yes. Let me share how to prepare for the rapture. One of the ways to stay ready for the rapture is to live a life of faith and righteousness. Hear what Jesus once asked his disciples in Luke 18:18. 18, 18. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on the earth? Beloved, devote yourself to the things that build your faith and motivate you to live a righteous life. Don't let anyone talk you out of the need to live a life of faith and righteousness. Ensure you're not just talking about purity, but also living it out as the Lord grants you grace and wisdom. Here's another way to keep yourself prepared for the rapture. 
study, and understand biblical teachings. As you're living ready, ensure you study God's Word and learn its principles for yourself. Every believer who does this becomes a workman who needs not be ashamed, applying the word of truth in all areas of life. Read, study, understand, and apply the Bible as it does. Do not develop itchy ears for new revelations that sound outstanding but lose the sincere truth of the Word of God. That a teaching is loud, mystical, or ambiguous does not make it the truth. In fact, in most cases, the truth of the Word of God comes in simple forms so that we may be thoroughly equipped to do good works. Number three, stay among the community of genuine believers. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Another way to live ready is to build or plug yourself into a community of believers. As the famous saying goes, the more the merrier. There is safety when you live a community life with other believers. The Bible encourages us not to neglect other believers' gatherings. Ensure nothing isolates you from fellowshipping with other believers. Isolation from the community of believers is not of God. Rather, it's usually sponsored by the devil. The fourth way to prepare for the rapture is by praying for guidance and strength. As we live in the last days, prayer is one of the ways we stay connected to the Lord, especially when it feels that we're all alone in this heavenly race. Pray to the Lord for guidance and strength, because your strength can fail. But when the Lord Himself equips you, you cannot fail. In conclusion, as you begin to take steps to prepare for the rapture, let me quickly remind you that God is placing signs along the way for us. The Bible didn't clearly state when the rapture will come. However, we were warned and taught to watch out for the signs that will come before the rapture. Jesus himself taught us of these signs and taught us to be on guard during the last days. You can find his warnings about how the rapture will happen and what to look out for in Matthew 24, 36 to 41. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken, the other left. There are many current events that show the rapture may happen at any time. For example, there's a massive wave of deception, devastation, and dispute among the nations of the world. We have more false prophets now than ever before. We have believers turning away from Jesus in large numbers. A growing number of people believe in secular humanism and other human philosophies that don't save anyone. All of these are the evidence that the end is almost here. But where can we find hope in the midst of all these? Is there any hope for anyone who's left behind? Yes. However, this set of people must pay a special price to meet the Lord again. They'll be subjected to inhuman torture, hunger, and punishment. These are temptations for them to lose their faith in Jesus and accept the beast's mark. At that time, the government of the Antichrist will be fully in operation. Still, there will be people left behind who will stand their ground and refuse to have anything to do with the government of the Antichrist. These people have to stay true to their faith even facing pain, hunger, and torture. If they don't give up, they will be saved at last. Now that you've heard about the rapture, those who can be raptured and the dangers of being left behind, my question for you is, are you prepared for the rapture? The rapture is not something that should catch us unaware. For believers, we have hope that one day we'll go and be with the Lord, either in life, in death, or through the rapture. Be encouraged, beloved. The end is near, and all the crises in this world will no longer have power over you. You will go and be with the Lord, and forever be at rest.
in the bliss of heaven. Do you know that God is very interested in your next decision? Your life is a combination of all your past decisions, and so your choices today will determine your future. Life is a series of decisions. Decisions about the things we do. Decisions about our career choices. Decisions about where to live. Decisions about the schools we attend. Decisions about what and where to invest our money. Decisions about who to marry, and so on. God, in His all-surpassing wisdom, has given every one of us the ability to make these decisions. However, there are things we don't get to decide in our lives. For instance, we don't decide who our parents are. We don't decide where we are born. And we don't decide our gender. God gives you these things in His wisdom and sovereignty. You could decide to disown your biological parents and call other people your parents. It still won't change the fact that you have their DNA. Calling yourself a different gender does not change your identity. But still, there are many things God gives us the liberty to decide for ourselves, and our lives are determined by the outcome of those decisions. God is always standing by His children, even under challenging circumstances. In the face of confusion, He is still with you. His Word says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Do you know that the same God who gave us the power to make decisions knows we are limited in our wisdom? He is aware of our limitations. He knows our limits. He knows what you know and what you don't. The truth is you can only make decisions about the things you know. You cannot make proper and accurate decisions about the things that you do not know. For example, a driver driving toward a sharp bend does not know what is ahead of them. In this scenario, the driver should be cautious. This helps them decide how to approach the bend, whether to slow down or speed up. However, they are limited to what they can see, hear, or feel from their position. Any decision at this point affects this driver and whoever may be coming down the other side of the road. Thus, you will often see road signs leading to sharp turns warning drivers to slow down. These warnings are given to save drivers from accidents that could cost lives. You can take the same picture and use it for life situations. While some people are making progress and being safe, some are having accidents and even losing their lives. What differentiates one group from the other? Why do some people appear like their decisions always lead to the right places and yours to the wrong places? I'm sure you'll like to know how you, too, can begin to enjoy the results of significant decisions and the blessings of escaping adverse effects in your life. The Bible tells us the secret to fruitful living. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5-8, through 8, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. In this video, I will share two vital signs that God is saying yes before you make your next decision. When you see these signs, the Lord is telling you, go ahead, the coast is clear. Number one, inner peace. All children of God enjoy peace from God. This peace is unexplainable and can only be experienced by God's children. We are often pressured to make complex decisions about life in the future, which leaves us anxious and agitated. It makes us lose our peace at such times. One way to know that God is leading you is the inner peace that He gives you. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible tells us that the peace of God will guard your hearts. The absence of this inner peace tells us that the decision we are about to make may not be in line with what God will have us do at that time. It may also suggest that the choice we are about to make or the steps we are about to take are not the will of God for us. Please pay attention to this. Many people have results but lack peace. 
even though they try to act like they're okay. Deep down, they just wish they could find solace somewhere. God spoke through his prophet in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast, because they trust in you. Here we see clearly that peace is one of the signs that a heart is steadfast, focused, and fixed on God. This kind of peace is the one that comes from within. The peace inspired by God in our hearts assures us about our decisions that everything is all right and to confirm that we are not alone and will be fine. Don't take the comfort that comes from this peace lightly. Most of the time, the fear of facing the consequences of our actions all alone drives us into low self-esteem, challenges our faith, and overwhelms us with the fear of rejection. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, and Let the peace, soul harmony which comes from Christ's rule, act as umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in that peaceful state, to which as members of Christ's one body, you are also called to live. And be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. So you see, my dear friends, the peace of God is an essential factor in your decision-making process. It is one of the ways God confirms that He is right here with us. Before your next decision, check yourself. Look within and search your heart for peace. Are you at peace with yourself and the will of God for your life? Do you feel troubled? If you lost your peace before making that decision, it could be the Lord telling you a firm no. If you are at peace, then the Lord is saying that your decision is in line with His will for you. Don't forget that God's will is expressed to us through His spirits in our hearts and with His words in the Bible. Number two, the comfort of the scripture. Romans chapter 15 verse four says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Please pay close attention to how the Bible says here that everything written in the past was written to teach and encourage us. In other words, the word of God is our guiding light and the one thing that should keep us going no matter what we face. So, when it comes to decision-making, our number one tool of reference must be the written Word of God. You need to find out how your next decision aligns with what the Word of God says. Does the Word of God completely agree with that decision you are about to make? For instance, some people believe that the person God wants them to marry is already married to someone else. But this is wrong. Why? because it doesn't agree with God's word about his will for marriage. In the book of Matthew, Jesus spoke about this directly, saying no one should separate two people whom God has joined together in marriage. In other words, what this person desires and is deciding on is totally against the word of God. And if it is against the word of God, it is totally against his will, because God's word is God's will. Many people embrace the Word of God until it conflicts with what they truly desire. Dear friend, you'll be doing yourself much good when you are humble enough to submit your decisions to the written Word of God. Make the Word of God the standard by which you rate your choices. As a child of God, everyone else can do whatever they want. But for us, the Word of God is our yardstick to determine what is wrong or right. Psalm 119 verse 105 points it out clearly. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. God's word shines its bright light to guide our choices and decisions in our daily activities. The revelation of God's word makes our path clear from errors, assumptions, and exaggerations that can lead us to damning consequences. The word of God helps us filter out mistakes in our decision making. Through the wisdom of God's word, we can decide what we know and what we don't know. Why? Because the Word of God is a life-giving agent. The Word of God is ancient and undying. It existed long before it was written. It existed long before the challenges and options before you. It knows the way and will lead those who trust it to take the lead. We can make accurate decisions about what we understand and don't understand because God's Word will always guide us on the right path. In your decision-making process, 
ensure that the Word of God is given its rightful place. Beloved, do not shut your ears against the counsel that comes from the wisdom of the Word of God. This wisdom will shield you against making terrible mistakes and errors that can cost you your life, visions, goals, ambitions, possessions, and achievements. Listen, giving God's Word its rightful place in your life as the pathfinder and guide of destiny is not archaic. Instead, it is the best way to play safe, gleaning the wisdom of God for your life. Failure to fine-tune your decisions with God's Word may result in failure in life. I know this sounds a bit harsh, but it is true. I am sure you know that God wants you to be successful and not a failure. So listen to His voice today and let this be a part of your decision-making process. Because we don't know the future, we must surrender our decisions to the Lord and let Him guide us on how to make them. Am I saying that committing our decisions to the Lord makes us immune from the hardship, rejection, and isolation that comes from obeying the voice of God? The answer is a big no. However, committing our decisions to the Lord assures us that in the midst of it all, He is standing beside us and inspiring us all the way. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 says, Whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. See how God is committed to leading you by His written word and spirit within you, speaking to and illuminating your heart. What decisions are you struggling with today? Do you feel stuck between two choices? The Bible is full of wisdom on how to make good decisions. Spend time with it. Pray and wait on the Lord. He will direct your path. We don't always make wise decisions. Occasionally, our own interests get in the way and distract us from God's plan for us. To overcome this, we should surrender our everyday decision-making to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Rest assured that He will lead and guide you by His Word and the peace that transcends all understanding. These signs are sure proof that your decisions are in line with God's will for you. Go boldly and fear not, because your Heavenly Father is with you. 2 Timothy 3, 8-9 Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers opposed the truth. They are men of depraved minds, who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far, because in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. How does the Lord Jesus ask you, me and every other person on earth, to live in these last days? Like a manual to guide you on how to make the most of a product, the Bible has been given to us to guide us. And a day will come when God will judge us by what we lived by and what we neglected. I'm praying that through this video, God will communicate to your heart, turn it to Him, and help you obey His word so that you can save your soul in eternity. Through your obedience or disobedience, you will either condemn your soul or save it. 1 Timothy 4.16 Watch your life and doctrine closely. Preserve them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I pray for you again. May you cooperate with God to save your soul in the end and not be condemned along with the disobedient and corrupt in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Child of God, the Bible is God's word and our guide to finding instructions on how to live our lives here on earth. It addresses every facet of life from birth to death. It also speaks about the happenings of the last days and gives us the required wisdom on how all of us should approach these last days so that our faith stands firm to the very end of time. Jesus taught his followers that even if the earth and sky fade away, not a single word spoken to us by him would go unfulfilled. God's word cannot lose its power regardless of the circumstance we find ourselves in and it will never fail to accomplish its purposes in the lives of those who believe, practice and adhere strictly to it. Luke 21, 33. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You can rest assured, my friend, that if God tells you anything about the last days, 
he understands that you need guidance on how to live in the last days to come. Also, his word is a compass that gives you the perfect guidance and reassurance that you will need every day as long as you are alive. You will harm yourself if you ever disconnect yourself from the word of God and his spirit. Some say that the world and the entire system is quickly growing and developing. True, the world we live in today is moving towards a new age, and this is what the Bible calls the last days. It will be a time where every single person on earth believer and unbeliever alike will see the manifestations of the prophecies of the Bible being played out in the events that will characterize these days. The scripture defined and likened the days we live in to the days of Noah where men and women were given to the lust of the age. This is to say that the same things that happened in the days of Noah will take place in the last days. The people of that time did not realize that the end was very near until Noah entered the ark. And then suddenly, the flood came and took them all away in judgment. This will happen the same way when the Son of Man will appear in His majesty and glory. Have you ever wondered about some of the things the Bible says about the last days? Dear friends, kindly listen to what the Lord Jesus tells us about the days ahead in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4. Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming he promised? Even since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Here we are clearly informed by the scripture that scoffers will increase and their evil activities will be seen. Their number one assignment will be pursuing after their evil desires through the kind of lifestyles that will exhibit and promote others to live. They downplay the need for you to live a life of total obedience to the scriptures. They subtly discourage anyone who stands with God's laws, and they strongly encourage disobedience to the ways of God. They will go through any length to ensure that the faith and love of many grow cold. Every now and then, they keep commenting about the promise of His coming. They will say things like, There is nothing like the coming of the Lord. It is all a thick. The promise of His return is long past. And thousands of years have passed since Jesus ascended into heaven, promising the return for His faithful ones. But are they right to doubt? No, they are not, because the Bible has given us the requisite wisdom about this in 2 Peter 3, 9, which says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. These mockers point out the lapse in time and mock those who still wait and yearn for His glorious appearance. They directly or indirectly conclude that because the glorious return of the Lord has been delayed, it means it will no longer happen. They have fallen into the deep snare of deceit just like in the days of Noah when he preached and publicly declared about the wrath that was to come upon them and the way of escape from God's wrath, but they wouldn't listen. Mockers are quick to debunk the truth and trade it for a lie so that they will stand justified and accepted to everyone around them. Believers in the scripture were also instructed about mockers in the last days in Jude 1, 17 through 19, which says, But dear friends, remember that the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. We must give careful attention to this particular set of people. These people treat the instructions of the Lord like a joke. They will look down on God's instructions, make light of the things God commands us to take seriously, and make a religion of their own fanciful impulses and lusts. These are the people who split and divide the body of Christ, the church. They may even show up as church leaders, but they do not have the spirit. Their goal is to set divisions among believers, cause disunity, and deceive as many as possible. These people are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, 
abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They have a semblance of godliness, but resist the power and grace of God that teach us to deny ungodliness and be holy. They pretend to respect God and His laws, but in reality, they don't want to have anything to do with God's power. In today's world, those who reject and make fun of Christ's return do so in various ways. Some just ignore and disobey biblical teachings. Others are very hostile to things that have to do with the Bible because they believe that religion is the root cause of suffering, hostility, and war. But we know that this is very far from the truth. If all of humanity would embrace and live by the laws of God, then the earth would experience total orderliness and the peace it seeks. We are already seeing an upsurge of mockers in the world today, and so many factors contribute to this. Access to media and other forms of technology provide an open platform for anyone with an opinion, and many mock everything that was once thought and taught as honorable to be a joke or mere deceit. The proliferation of mockers today is a sign of the last days. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Pride leads to mockery, just the way it did before the Tower of Babel very long ago. The people became consumed by their own importance and significance until they wanted to challenge anything that stood as a threat to what they thought about themselves. Just the same way today, scoffers are trying so hard to redefine gender, marriage, and values, and created a fantasy world in which reality becomes whatever we feel it is. These people reject and refuse to believe the word of the Lord and set themselves up as their own gods. But listen to what God's word says in Romans 1, 21 through 22 about these people. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Scoffing and mockery have been present since the beginning right in the Garden of Eden. Satan's first attempt to deceive man was a form of scoffing at God's commandment. Did God really say? It is critical and very important that every Christian takes the commands of the Lord seriously and follows them regardless of the schemes of the enemy to persuade, deceive, and turn our hearts away from the Lord. We must hold fast to that which we have lest it be taken away from us. We must fix our eyes on the Lord and remain true to what He called us to and stand by it until He returns. Finally, we must not entertain the counsel of mockers and scoffers, as this will be walking against the precept of God for us as believers here on earth. We must maintain our stand in the faith and wait for the return of the Lord. Even though His coming tarries, it is eminent that one day Jesus will return just the way He ascended. He will descend to the earth again, but this time He will not come as the Savior of the world, but as the Judge. He will bring God's judgment to the earth, to as many who refuse and reject Him. Let me leave you with these last words from the book of 2 Peter 3, 13-15. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you, with the wisdom that God gave him.